introduction. I won't say anything else. It's just that I'm really delighted to be here. I really enjoyed my morning, and um, I somewhat apologize for those that had to listen to me for the last three hours. You're probably tired of hearing from me, but um, I'm going to switch to uh, a different topic, but one that's related to my morning presentation. I ended the morning presentation, if you'll remember, saying that I had studied probation, and then I studied prisons, and the conclusion of that four years of work was that neither of those options were particularly good. That led me to begin another work, uh, which started about two years ago, the title of which, would it be easier if the lights were turned out for any of you? Um, the title of which is Expanding Options for Criminal Sentencing. And the results are published in this booklet, which I'll be happy to mail anybody who would like a full copy of it free. You just hand me your card. I also have Xeroxes of the slides that I'm going to be using today, and you're welcome to take a copy when I'm finished. And I also have Xeroxes of the executive summary of this report. So don't feel like you have to take it over right, because I think there's ready. adequate copies of the slides okay. for you to have and take with you after the presentation. Now I think what brings this particular topic to such an important role in the policy debate is what I call this prison probation dilemma, which is um, something I think if you're in the field like most of you are or aware of, of the context of criminal justice you relate to. And on the one hand, we have prison. Prison populations have doubled in the past decade. And most people don't realize this, but the net increase in the U.S. prison population is 2,000 persons per month that that population increases. The total pie, however, we hear a lot about prisoners and a lot about prison crowding. Prisoners only are about 18% of the total persons who pass through the criminal justice system on any one day. Um, they're relatively small proportion when you consider them in relationship to probation, which is some of what I'll do later. But the prison crowding crisis has created a situation where all the eight states are now under court order to alter either their prison capacity or their conditions within the prison. And Texas is, is one of those states that is under court order regarding the legality of their prison. $9.4 billion is spent each year to operate corrections in the United States. 60% of the corrections dollar goes to handle or supervise 18% of the criminal population, which is those that are in prison. So you see this disproportionate amount of money going to supervise a relatively small percent of the criminal population. We've got in a situation where we are building and building, and we've now allocated at late, latest count about $10 billion for new prison construction. Today in the United States, there's about 180 prison facilities under construction. So you can see that we are clearly in a building mode. We will create about 80,000 new prison beds um, by the year 2000. And after we've spent all of that money, um, and after all of those prisons have been constructed, all the projections show that we will still be about 20% under capacity. So we are not going to be able to build ourselves out of the prison population boom, if you will. The alternative to prison for most felons is probation. Um, and probation doesn't get nearly the attention that prison does. In fact, most people, uh, if you talk to the general public, will in fact not be sure what probation is. They will think of it as parole. Probation itself has, has um, relatively low public visibility and credibility. But probation populations have also doubled in the past decade. And every month they increase by 9,000 persons. 9,000 more persons next month be on probation in the United States than were the case last month. So there's a tremendous growth. Um, but only 20% of the corrections dollars goes to house or supervise two-thirds of the criminal justice clientele. So again, you've got a small amount of dollars in this instance being spread across a very large percent of persons. Um, most probation budgets have declined. And in fact, uh, a study conducted a couple of years ago showed that probation was the only criminal justice line item to have either declined 
in funding or to stabilize. Everything else, the police, the courts, parole, corrections, have all experienced a dramatic increase in terms of budget. Probation has not. And it's primarily because the public and the judicial support for probation are very low. Um, so we've got this dilemma. On the one hand, we've got prison increasing, extremely expensive, and even everything we do doesn't seem to be able to build ourselves out of the prison population bulge that we're now having. On the other hand, we've got probation. Seems to be receiving very little support. Most in probation would say they've got too large caseloads <coughs> to really affect any change in their clientele. So you've got this dilemma. Now, the, the primary responses to that dilemma are these. You can either develop less expensive ways to imprison. And that's something that um, is a lot of people are devoting energy to. Uh, you see in New York Harbor transferring uh, inmates onto boats where they can actually serve their time. Old military facilities, uh, prefab housing. There's a lot of effort to just figure out how to house people less expensively, and there's been some success in that. But there's a whole other array of programs that are now being tried and funded um, that are to find ways of punishing people outside of the prison cell. And that's mainly what the work that I've been involved in in the last couple of years has been devoted to, is to find other ways to punish people outside of prison. Now, I use the word punish not lightly. I think that realistically, the public wants punishment. I think that the criminal deserves punishment, and I think that's what these programs are in the business of delivering. And sometimes people find that objectionable. It's mainly uh, a recognition of the political realities in which we're dealing with, and I think that um, we are trying to punish people, hold them accountable is really a better word. These kinds of programs are the most popular approaches to doing that. The report that, this report, um, was produced at, to try to find out what states were doing to respond to prison crowding, basically, or this prison probation dilemma. Um, what I did was conduct a nationwide survey of every probation and parole department that supervised more than 250 adults. Located, um, first did a mail survey, finding out what kind of programs they were involved in, what the results have been, and I accumulated all that material uh, and then published a report specifically geared towards policymakers. This would be very easy reading for you all, I'm sure. Uh, it's not an academic document. I wrote it so that you could hand it to a legislature that's trying to find other ways of punishing people without a prison cell. And there's chapters here on intensive supervision, house arrest, electronic monitoring, boot camp prisons, and these eight alternatives, if you will. Now, the most popular program that I found in doing this work uh, was intensive supervision. And this, this survey was conducted about two years ago now, and you'll see how the programs have changed more recently. But two years ago, everybody was into intensive supervision, and they still are. Today, you can't walk into a modern probation or parole agency that doesn't have an intensive supervision program. Um, if so, they're just a dinosaur. I mean, anybody who thinks they're a good agency has jumped on the bandwagon to implement an intensive supervision program of some type. Forty states are now implementing them in a formal sense. All states are implementing, as far as I can tell, in an eager and informal or formal sense. Most of them are modeled after Georgia's intensive supervision program. Um, Georgia, in 1982, began a program of intensive supervision designed to divert prisoners back to the community under very strict guidelines where they were required to see their probation officer three times a week, hold a job, pay restitution, etc. That program received a great deal of public visibility. It was on uh, the night of the news, it was on 2020, 60 Minutes did a segment on the front page of the New York Times. So that intensive supervision program, whether or not it works or not, and um, that's another story. It caught the attention of basically the nation. 
and was quickly seen as a, a solution to a state facing prison crime. It was Georgia cut its prison commitments by 10% in uh, three years, and they basically said that it was as a result of their intensive supervision program. So almost every state was interested. They started sending droves of people to Georgia um, to study that program, went home, and started doing similar kinds of things. So when you ask people, what does their ISP program look like? The survey shows that over half of the programs say they look exactly like the one that we started in Georgia. We modeled our program after them. Um, in nearly all of the intensive supervision programs, clients are screened using some objective scoring device. In most instances, it's the National Institute of Corrections Risk Needs Scale. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that, but it is an objective device which rates people based on their characteristic and then connects that score with their risk to the community or their risk of failure while on probation. So almost all the intensive supervision programs use that device, and your programs here in Texas actually uh, all use that device. But that's a similarity. There are, every program is so different. When you go out there and look at intensive supervision, they all have the same name, and there are probably no similarities, a few similarities between most programs. Some exclude violent offenders, some concentrate on them. Some exclude drug offenders, some concentrate on them. Um, the number of contacts, there is no one set contact. And in fact, you'll see one of the low programs is usually the Texas Probation Program. Their intensive supervision program guidelines state that they will see clients two times per month. Well, that compares to, in Idaho, their statewide guidelines say that that probationer will see his probation officer every day. Both of the programs, two a month versus every day, are under the same title of intensive supervision. So one thing I hope you understand is that, that just because the title of a program substantively it means very little. You've got to go and look at that program. Um, nearly all the programs require the offender to do community service, be employed, and pay a supervision fee. So that is similar. Um, and now, in the last couple of years, we've seen a tremendous growth of electronic monitoring. So many of the programs have now instituted intensive supervision, plus other kinds of curfew detectors, if you will, and I'll talk a little bit about those. Now, the advantages and why everybody seems to be so excited about intensive supervision are these. First of all, it's touted as being cost effective. And the argument is really very simple. If you, in fact, averted somebody from prison, you save the cost of putting that person in prison as well as the cost of constructing a cell. In today's prison commitment environment, Every commitment now needs a difficulty in terms of placement and sell. So we're not alone to talking about just the operational cost of prison, which are about 15000 a year, but somebody's also worrying about building a cell because those states are overcrowded. So the cost-effective argument is an easy one to make. If you convert that prisoner and put him in a community which costs about two to 3000 a year, you would, in fact, save those dollars. Probation and parole also seem to enjoy the benefits of intensive supervision. They argue that, in fact, it is socially beneficial to keep the offender in the community with a job, etc. Judges seem to love it because it can be used at any point in sentencing. Intensive supervision can be used after sentencing, prior, when somebody is on pretrial status, work release, back in, parole supervision as part of a jail sentence, it can basically be plugged in any part of the system. And so when I describe to you that intensive supervision means so many different things, not only do the program mean so different, but the clientele coming to the program is often vastly different. Um, you, can, you can have, in some instances, very lightweight people, and in other instances, quite serious people. Um, and it's rather quick and easy to implement. Uh, probation and parole offices have long had intensive caseload. Um, they usually have some degree of surveillance requirements. So putting a formal label on their intensive caseload sometimes is exactly what they were doing anyways. Um, they've had intensive caseloads, and now all you're doing is formalizing it. And um, so a lot of states have been able to quickly get this program up and running. 
and that's another of its, its advantages. But its, its major advantage is cost. And these are the average costs of supervision when somebody is in these various sanctions. So you see that routine probation costs about $1,000 per year as an average across the United States. Actually, your sanctions here in Texas are um, less expensive than the nationwide average. You do things cheaper. Um, intensive probation, you see it's, it on average is about 5000 per year, all the way up to state prison, which on average is about 15000 a year. So if you show this to the public and you say, give me some of these people, download them to these kinds of sanctions, will immediately save money, which every state is interested in. Um, there are problems with this calculation, and it leaves out a lot of critical elements, um, like the cost of reprocessing the failures, court costs, victim costs. Um, so, but in policy discussions, this is the figure that gets states very interested in implementing intensive supervision. Now, Intensive supervision programs focus on all different kinds of offenders. What I've done here is just take some of the ones that I'm involved with and show you the different kinds of clients that are going to them. In Massachusetts, there are probationers um, that are being placed on intensive. All the way up to California, we've got jail inmates going on intensive in buying out parts of their jail term if they agree to serve it on intensive. New Jersey, takes people who've been committed to prison already, after 60 days, they can reapply for sentencing, renewed sentencing through the judge to be placed back in the community on their state's intensive supervision program. Texas has a program which is dealing with high-risk parolees on intensive supervision. Now, if you think about it, who somebody is dealing with in these programs is going to affect their, quote, success as we measure it, usually in terms of recidivism. So when people say, well, what's the recidivism rate of intensive supervision programs? First of all, intensive supervision programs differs widely in terms of what we're talking about, but they also, I can tell you, well, Massachusetts has a 10% recidivism rate. In Texas, we've got about a 60% recidivism rate, and it's all due to the fact that one program is taking more serious people to begin with. So there is no average about how well they're doing. And I think you should look skeptically when you hear results of these kinds of programs. Um, Texas uh, has the highest risk offenders, as far as I can tell, of any state out on intensive supervision. And I will give you a little background about why that's the case uh, in a minute. Now, there's a number of disadvantages. It used to be Around 1985, we thought intensive supervision was terrific. Everybody thought it was terrific. And now, over time, the last couple of years, some disadvantages have started to surface. One is that some perceive intensive supervision to be too lenient. If you are, in fact, diverting a truly prison-bound offender back out to the community, then some people will believe that anything you do is leniency if you're doing it in the community. We've had some victims groups mad um, begin to question whether or not this movement towards intensive supervision goes directly against what they've been working at the last three or four years, which is to get people incarcerated. If you look at the participants in intensive supervision and some of these other options I'll describe, over half of all participants in intensive supervision have been alcohol-related offenders. So it is a serious problem if you're a mad supporter in that you are beginning to divert large numbers of drunk drivers back out to the community under these kinds of programs. And practitioners who originally seemed rather supportive of intensive supervision, arguing that this was probation and parole like it was supposed to be and had been, and historically, now are starting to realize that it's not only that you've decreased caseload, but you've now you've changed the purpose behind what you're about. And it's clearly a law enforcement orientation and some practitioners are beginning to worry that ISP is focusing too heavily on guarding people and not enough on helping them. And so unions that used to be supportive of their departments uh, are starting to question and begin a little bit of organization around whether or not they want to be involved in these uh, new 
found, if you will, in Texas supervision programs. Also finding that the requirements that allow people to come into intensive supervision program may have an underlying class and race bias. And I mentioned that if you look at participants to date, most of them have are property offenders and drunk drivers. And if you then also exclude from those categories of offenses those people that cannot pay a supervision fee, cannot show uh, employment that they've got it if we let them back out to the cannot pay restitution, and a number of other things, what you end up doing is culling out from that group that was already pretty white, middle class, somewhat offenders, that group that is predicted to do well and they tend to be um, white and have higher incomes. So when you compare that group to the general population, they look different. And some groups, especially the ACLU, have started to write briefs about the class and race bias that may be being associated with these prison diversion for programs that are um, being developed around the country. This is also a major problem that has been associated with every prison diversion program since day one in the United States, and that is that once it starts up and running, that in truth you don't end up handling cases that truly would have gone to prison. People are afraid to, to experiment with that kind of case. What you end up doing is selecting people who would have normally gotten a fine or routine probation and upping their supervision. Now, in my introduction, I told you that the whole purpose behind all of these programs is to respond to prison crowding. That is really why the attention is focused now in 1988 on these programs. If prison crowding went away tomorrow, so would these programs. So if you set up a program designed to divert people from prison, and it's in fact not decreasing costs, but raising the costs, because you haven't diverted anybody, but you've in fact taken part of that two-thirds that was on probation and put them in these programs, the whole dollar cost of a local criminal justice community may go up. And we're finding that it in fact is. You're widening the net of social control. And not only does that have detrimental effects to those people that are caught in that wider net, it also has economic implications as well. But then there's those people who, again, see that if you are truly diverting a, a person from prison, then anything other than prison is more risky for the community. So some of these problems, um, the disadvantages, I think, are starting to be felt more seriously in the field of probation and parole um, than they were, say, five years ago. Now, a question I, I think there's probably some of you who had experience in probation and parole, and you may be sitting there thinking, you know, we did intensive supervision under LAAA in the mid-70s. You know, this is nothing new. Well, these programs are new. The intensive supervision concept, which means simply, at its most simplistic level, it simply means reducing caseload and seeing the person more frequently. We've done that before in probation and parole. Um, but it was not for the same purpose. We did it before when we were trying to help and counsel people. We did a lot of those kinds of activities. If you look at intensive supervision and probation control that is now practiced, it is not towards that end. It is towards a different end, which is holding people accountable. Rehabilitation may, in fact, be some of the goals, but it's, it's down at a lower level. Um, today's ISPs are different. They clearly emphasize control. They emphasize curfews, they emphasize urinalysis testing, um, community support, restitution, community service, victim statements. If you look at them, they emphasize control and not necessarily rehabilitation. Um, the client usually pays. This was never part of the system in the past. The client now pays thirty to three hundred dollars a month to be a participant in these programs and avoid a prison term. Um, and the notion is there is strict revocation policy. In the past, that was not the case. Probation and parole held people out in abeyance on their caseloads for as long as they could. Um, this is not the case. In fact, when you look, when you really get down to some of these programs and their officers, they talk and act very much like police officers. Um, 
counseling and employment, et cetera, may be part of the program, but it's not emphasized, and it's not what these programs are sold on. And I think that's an important point to remember that I've at least learned, is that these programs sell themselves on one thing to get funded, and the policymakers talk a very tough game, um, which may or may not be transferred to the local line officer who's doing the work. Now, there's a number of unresolved questions. Um, first of all, are ISPs really cost effective? I think I told you if you're detecting, if you're truly taking somebody who would have gone to prison, then maybe you are. But in past experience, most of these people would not have gone to prison. So that you haven't saved money, you've in fact increased um, the overall cost to the system. In California, we're having a very big problem uh, because who should pay for intensive supervision programs? In our state, um, the state is responsible for prisons, but the local jurisdiction funds probation. Well, if you set up intensive supervision and you've diverted a person and he's remaining in the community, the county picks up a very expensive client. The state saved the prison debt, so who should pay for that? Should the county pick up the total cost of supervising that individual, or should the state have some payback if the county has, in fact, kept somebody who would have occupied the prison bed in their local community. And we're starting to see, as I said, will the public and victims advocates and civil rights groups accept they're becoming much more vocal uh, than they were two or three years ago. And probation and parole in agencies that have done intensive supervision and house arrest and electronic monitoring are having to change the structure. I think we will see probation and parole in two or three years that does not look exactly similar to anything we've ever seen before, and that's one is 24-hour supervision. Several probation departments, um, well, a handful, one in California, one Tom Callanan, who used to be here in Riverside, is going to 24-hour probation supervision. His contention is that probation is the only criminal justice agency that works banker's hours, and criminals don't keep banker's hours. He was telling me the other day, he said, I find it ironic that when the criminals go out to work, our probation staff go home. So he said, I'm going to start manning the probation office 24 hours a day. And when you begin to buy into a law enforcement mentality which suggests I'm going to uncover violations and revoke you, then you are into a 24-hour-a-day operation. And I think that we will, we will see more of that um, as these programs become more widespread. Um, it's also true that some departments are having to let off a lot of their old line probation and parole officers. This does reflect a totally different orientation in terms of what the purpose of your job is. If it's not rehabilitation and you have a social work mentality, you were trained to help people, you were trained in counseling, you're not probably too comfortable with now becoming a police officer. Um, so many of these departments are having to rethink the training and the recruitment of probation and parole staff if in fact the function is much different today. Now, one thing I'm usually asked is, do these programs work? Well, first of all, I've, I've told you that, that the programs differ so much and the clientele differs so much. And this, and this question is really very difficult to answer. In fact, it's impossible to answer. Um, there are a great variation out there. And sure, some programs work and some don't. Um, there have actually been few evaluations. Only a handful of states have evaluated the program, and none of them to date have involved random assignment. So you never know if it's the intensive supervision program that's working, or that the judges just pick out the best, whom they knew that they would succeed regardless of what supervision they were put on. And we can't separate out that effect. Um, we don't know uh, simply because the evaluations have been so poor whether or not intensive supervision really can perform any of these goals that we set out for it. Uh, I'm involved in a number of random assignment experiments now that will hopefully answer that two years down the line. But to date, we don't know. Um, one of the, we clearly need documentation of this type, and I'm sure that you all have done evaluations relate to um, the fact that this is, this evaluations have been very poorly done. 
the documentation that we're getting here in Texas um, involves two intensive supervision programs that are ongoing, one in Houston, one in Dallas. Uh, we began working with Texas about a year ago. Uh, the purpose, if you remember that um, about this time, April 87, before, before that, um, your system was under court order to reduce commitments to TDC or receive a daily fine of $800,000. Judge Justice had, had said that that was what he was going to do. Um, I received a call from the Texas Board of Pardons and Parole. Um, the director there is no longer there, so I was going to say his name, but I think he's left some bad feelings for some people. But I received a call saying we have one month to reduce commitments to the Texas Department of Corrections. He said we've got a lot of money to do it, a lot of money relative to what these programs usually are funded, like on the order of $2 million. And we don't really know what to do, but we know we've got to do something and it's got to get online fast and it does start showing that we're trying to reduce commitments. And he said, would you come out and consult with us to help us design a program to do this? And we only have a month and we've got to get on board, we've got to hire people, it's got to be up and running. And so I came to Texas and spent a week in Austin working with the Texas Parole Board and we designed these two projects in Texas intensive supervision projects which were designed around these characteristics. We set up caseloads, we hired 13 officers in Houston, 7 in Dallas. We set up an intensive supervision parole project in each of those sites. The caseload was, was to be 25 to 1, 25 offenders to 1 officer. Uh, 85 to 1 was the regular parole caseload in those jurisdictions. Um, we were going to mandate more intensive contact contact they have been having was about 10 per month. We were going to um, we were going to mandate 10 per month. They had been having about 3 per month. We were also going to use what I call a graduated sanction response. An individual would be put on a program that in, entailed some of these aspects and at failure, rather than sending him right back to, to TBC, he would be go to the next phase, which would be more restrictive. He would then go into a house arrest phase, which would have curfews during the week. He would then go into a weekend curfew house arrest. He'd go then into 24-hour house arrest. He'd then go into electronic monitoring. We would try to do whatever we could do to keep him out of the TDC, but show that we were, in fact, tightening control. Um, the Texas Department of, uh, the Texas Parole Board funded those programs. Um, and I asked whether or not they would be willing to participate in an outside evaluation, if in fact I could go get money to do that. And they were very anxious to have it evaluated. And um, I told them that there was really only one condition that if I was going to go try to get money to evaluate the program that they had to agree to, and that was to allow me to do random assignment of their cases. Now what it involves, it is the only time this has ever been done in Texas, and we're doing this in about 10 other states, they decide who's eligible at the site. This person is an eligible according to written criteria. They call into the RAND Corporation. We then assign to the intensive supervision or he continues on regular parole. We've done that now for about, um, about 2,000 cases for both sites combined, um, about 1,000 in each. And, um, it so far worked out very well. We have, we will be de doing six month, 12 month, and 24 month follow up. We are measuring the kinds of services they got because one of the problems with these intensive supervision programs is that you put somebody into them, but in fact the supervision they got was really no more intensive than had they gone to a regular caseload. We're measuring the kind of services. And what we're going to do is find out whether or not any of this made a difference. Um, First of all, we're trying to find out whether or not, if you do intensify supervision, can you decrease commitments to TDC? And I can just give you a preview of the findings that I've looked at just in the past week is no, these programs have not been successful at reducing commitments to TDC. In fact, they seem to be having the opposite effect. We are watching people close more closely. We're finding out more violations 
And so the probation or parole officer, in order to keep the meat in the program, has got to violate somebody. So if we take these two people who've been randomly assigned, what we're finding, and this is particularly true in Houston, that the officers are doing a very good job. They do, in fact, they are uncovering so much more than they would have known about before. That's causing them to respond, and they're having to respond toughly. And when you look at it, they're increasing. This program is having the opposite impact of what it was funded to do. And um, we are also going to find out uh, how much this program really did cost. When you're violating people, you're taking up court time, you're putting people in jail. Is it, in fact, the two to $5,000 program cost that people say it will be? So I think those results will be, they've actually been sent to uh, the Texas Parole Board last week. I told them I was going to say that. Was that okay? And uh, I think it will be, we will continue the program, but it will be, it was a last ditch effort to figure out how to keep people out of prison. And um, we clearly need to rethink this strategy because it doesn't seem to be working. Now, intensive supervision has led about a year ago to the next phase of intensive supervision, which is house arrest. Um, you know, house arrest, we never really have heard of house arrest uh, in modern day sentencing policy until very recently. And now, because prison space has become so scarce, judges have become very creative at finding other space. And what has happened is they've turned people's homes into that prison cell that they cannot afford to build. So they've created a structure and sentenced the person to his own home to serve his sentence. Um, about 20 states have now begun house arrest programs. Uh, and they, they run the gamut. But most people don't realize that house arrest sentencing nationwide is, is new and it's also usually for very short term. People are sent to their homes for three or four months. They can usually go out for medical reasons, employment, um, and to be in treatment. And it's usually a nighttime curfew, and then it gradually gets restricted as they violate the conditions. Um, it may be part of an intensive supervision program. And it's often very confusing when people are trying to get a handle on these programs intensive supervision and electronic monitoring and house arrest, they all kind of feed in together. And that's because they all are, are in essence, this distinction I'm making for you is not one that the field recognizes for itself. Many intensive supervision programs use house arrest and use electronic monitoring. And so they all kind of sometimes are part of the same formal program. Um, but house arrest also is, is kind of a, um, the next generation of intensive supervision is designed to even look tougher than intensive when you say we've got a house arrest program. Um, Florida really began doing house arrest to any large extent and still today they are the state that has sent thousands and thousands of offenders to formal house arrest which they call community control. But other states have also gone into it. Um, it's used throughout the sentence. Oklahoma uses house arrest as its last security measure. They've got minimum, maximum, uh, minimum, medium, maximum, and house arrest status. A prisoner actually, before you can be released to the community, serves a house arrest phase in in Oklahoma Department of Corrections. So it's, it's, it's again being used all over. House arrest has some of the same advantages and disadvantages that intensive supervision did. Um, thought to be cost effective, socially effective, um, it can be used throughout sentencing, and it's easy to implement. And the additional benefit is that it allows you more control, and that's why intensive supervision programs who've been operational for about a year find themselves looking for another alternative, which is tougher than intensive, but still not prison, and most of them then develop a house arrest kinds of program. Once they've got house arrest, what they do is they get into the electronic monitoring business. Um, so if you if you kind of watch this field, in the early 80s, intensive supervision was really big. Around 82, 83, intensive supervision pr programs that had been in existence started developing house arrest programs. And in 83, 85, 
house arrest program started getting electronic monitoring. So it's, I don't know what we're going to have next, but um, it's all fed on itself. Um, electronic monitors are now used in a number of states. We have them here in Texas. Um, they also are used for sentenced and unsentenced offenders. They are used as part of IPS. I told you they're also used for house sentencing. There's two types. There's actually more than two types now, but the most popular electronic monitors include a passive system. It's called passive because the offender isn't required to do anything. He simply is required to have it on. He can remain passive. And the system automatically sees through a computer, through his phone, and to his bracelet where he is. And if he leaves from 150 feet of that phone, if he's out of that radius, then a beeper goes off and the probation or parole officer is notified that that individual has broken his house arrest curfew restriction. Um, the active system requires the offender to activate it. And he's required to, when the phone rings, insert his bracelet in a module which is next to the phone, which makes the connection, which says, I am here um, where I'm supposed to be. So um, those are the two most popular systems we now uh, well, this, this might be kind of interesting to you because people are actually developing it in the first site that they're trying to develop for is Houston. And I had a call a couple of weeks ago um, with a developer here in Texas who is attempting to use cellular telephone technology to create a 500 mile radius zone where offenders will be allowed to be tracked within that zone um, on a computer and you will actually be able to program what streets certain individuals will be allowed on. And if they, they're allowed to go out of their house, and, you, know, you now can program them into walking to their employment, walking to treatment. You can do all sorts of things. Um, and the technology is being developed here in Texas and in Florida. And it now exists. I saw a demonstration of it. You can sit there with the module. You can have a, somebody wear this bracelet. And you can actually track him throughout the community and get a hard copy print of that individual's schedule. So I think that we haven't seen the end of this yet, and we probably won't for quite some time, because the technology is moving, I think, faster than our conceptions of what this can do as part of criminal sense. And when I asked the individual who's developing this and who works for a technology company, he does not care about the issues involved here that this would raise. All he cares about is selling the system. And um, those people have been very effective so far in uh, moving this electronic monitoring business out into the community. Um, two years ago, there were two counties that were using electronic monitoring, and now the latest count of the National Institute of Justice, there's 40 counties that have bought them and are using electronic monitoring for offenders. Um, but there's a lot of publicity, and a lot of counties are using it, but when you actually go to those counties and say, how many people? have on electronic monitoring. So far there's been about three to five thousand offenders who have actually completed sentences while under electronic monitoring. So our experience is really very skim about who can be placed on electronic monitoring. Um, and from looking at the characteristics of the offenders, they are likely most of the people who are on electronic monitoring are succeeding. But again, you don't know if they're succeeding just because they would have succeeded regardless, or that there's something that the electronic monitoring does, deter or rehabilitate, whatever you want to call it, that in fact produces such positive outcomes. Now, I made this chart to just show you not only the vast array of programs and development, but where electronic monitor offenders are. And you will see when I plotted the program, electronically monitored monitoring is being plugged into about every facet of criminal justice. I mean, it's being used at the initial arraignment for people who are released on OR. They'll say you can be released on OR if you agree to wear a bracelet. Um, Pre-trial, at sentencing, judges are sentencing people directly to electronic monitoring as a condition of probation as a condition front end alternative throughout the entire system. Um, again, the point to understand is when people say, does it work? Does electronic monitoring work? Well, 
for who, where, what time. You know, it's just there's so many variations that it's really impossible uh, to get a handle on it. There's some other things that, that are discussed in this report uh, that are also, I think, the boot camps. If I describe intensive way into house arrest, house arrest went into electronic. Electronic is going into boot camp prisons. It's the next kind of sexy alternative that hit the United States. Um, a year ago, there was one boot camp, and now there's something like 11. Um, and Texas actually is developing a boot camp facility. Uh, Georgia, then, you know, these are, there's, they're popping out all over. And it's very interesting that, to think of why, but it's all designed to get tough, but yet not use that scarce prison bed. So how tough can you get? And that's, you know, kind of the challenge. Well, we'll limit their stay, and when they're there, will be really tough. Boot camps, basically, are military-type run prison usually a wing of a prison designed for young first offenders. And the idea is to, same shock incarceration notion, that if you make it tough while they're there, they won't come back. So um, usually they're in prison, separate wing, uh, isolated from the more advanced criminals. And they're there for only one or two months, and they go through very strict, and then they're placed back out of the community on intensive supervision. Another thing that is starting to happen is a lot of programs are starting to develop in something called a police probation cooperative team. And this kind of evolves naturally. As intensive supervision, as those probation and parole officers get more surveillance oriented, they're getting closer and closer aligned, not only philosophically, but what they do in their job with police officers. You go into very law enforcement oriented police Oh, there's a very close connection now between what they do and the police. They even ride around in the same car, which would, it would be unheard of 15 years ago. And they were always seen as kind of natural enemies, probation and the police. And now they are sharing some of the same goals, sharing some of the same office space, and feeding back intelligence information. And so in many places, they have begun to start a formal arrangement, which they call these probation parole slash with the police cooperative team. Um, the police, how it works in practice, is that the police carry a laminated card with the probation or parolee's names that are on intensive, their curfew hours, their condition. They are asked by the probation to help monitor these conditions. And they can drop in, they take your analysis, give the results to the probation officer. They drop by for curfew, feed that information back to the probation officer. They assist the Probation officer, when they've got to make random home visits at night, the probation officer may not feel comfortable doing it alone. So I think we're seeing that this closer connection between probation and parole and the police is going to uh, certainly happen. And because probation has been so strapped and parole for, for resources and manpower, they started soliciting in a way that is different than just volunteering. Um, in New Jersey, they have something called a community sponsor and a network team. That means their people on intensive supervision, in order to be placed on the program, have got to identify one person whom they name as a community sponsor. That person has to agree to allow them to live in their home for the first month of supervision and agree to, to help this person on critical kind of emergency situations, such as getting the person to and from a job. And he also gets three or four members of the community to sign a contract saying they will serve as his community network. All of these people sign a formal contract through the parole department um, saying they will be responsible if this person is allowed out of the prison into the community. Um, I think we're going to see much more of that. It's not the helping role the volunteers used to play, but it's helping <coughs> to monitor and survey that center in the community. There's been some problems with that because um, neighborhoods are now finding out who is in their neighborhood more so than they used to. You start getting community members and you want the, you know, the local priest or whatever to start signing contracts. What happens is you start putting out information that tells the neighborhood so-and-so is being released from prison. And, he's in, and so instead of having this positive effect that was anticipated, you sometimes bring about a very negative resistance 
from the community towards having these people uh, placed in their community. Now, I think that we need to proceed cautiously with these programs. Um, I think, and I've been a, long been an advocate for these alternative programs. Um, I am not a Green Park liberal. I basically uh, believe in, in the accountability that I think these programs can bring about. And I do believe that if they are successful, that it will help bring balance back to this sentencing system. And we won't have simply probation and prison, neither of which I think are the most appropriate response for a number of people. Um, but I also think that just working with policymakers, that they are, they are just about at the end of their ropes in terms of um, allowing us to experiment in terms of things that are seen as liberal. And that I see it kind of as a last ditch effort. A lot of these programs are being put in place primarily because of resources, not because they have a lot of public support. And if they fail, then I think we will get back to where we are right now, um, just putting people in prison. So I think it's kind of, it's a very critical time. I think um, developing programs that must reflect the local needs of the community. Um, I am working with, with about 10 states, developing these programs, evaluating them, et cetera. And that experience has taught me that, that our states are dramatically different um, in terms of how many people could be let out from prison to these programs. Um, you know, in some states, we have a lot of lightweights in prison that don't need to be there. The state could save us money if it didn't develop any of these programs and just let out about half the people that are there. In California, I don't believe that's the case at all. Um, I believe that many of the people that are now on probation need to be in prison. That you couldn't probably let out very many people from the California prison. So, and Texas falls, uh, if here's California and here's, let's say, Georgia, I would say Texas is about right here. You've got a lot of people that um, wouldn't be in prison in other states. But I want to, I'll show you a chart to that effect, but I want to end this part of um, what I want to say to you by just kind of trying to step back from these individual programs that I've described, I mean, food camps and the intensive supervision, and think through what this means for criminal justice sentencing more generally, because I think we are getting there, and I would I think that about, um, you know, right now we're doing these individual programs, but over time we will begin to develop a system, and it might look something like this. Right now, about 70% of all people that are convicted go to probation, and about 30% go to prison. That's what we currently do with people in a very rough sense nationwide. Now, what, what you see happening in some of the more evolved places that have a lot of these options going on is that routine probation slips back and prison gets pushed back and a number of these programs come in the middle, which are called intermediate sanctions, if you think of this whole group. Um, and I've seen, like, just take Georgia, for example. Uh, they were one of the states that got involved in this whole sentencing option very early. Delaware is another one. They've now been into it four or five years, and their system starts looking like this. They first started intensive supervision. Well, then it, what happens is that some of the people are doing well. Why are we spending so much money? Let's start phasing them down. So you get restrictions that phase people down. But then somebody starts screwing up. Well, Part of the reason they're screwing up is that you're watching them more closely. You're now finding out a lot of technicals that you didn't know. With prison crowding, you don't want those people sent to prison, but you want to look tough. You've got your, credi your credibility is on the line. You've got to do something. So you start developing options which are a little more serious, um, but yet not prison. So that's when electronic monitoring, house arrest, we now have um, in Georgia, a facility designed specifically for probation and parole violators who did not commit new crime but violated the technical conditions of their supervision. 30 day, they go in there, they spend 30 days and they come back out. That's a residential kinds of programs are starting to develop. So you can kind of see that you 
kind of see what we're doing if you step back from the programs and look at the overall global picture. Uh, and we now have a way to do it. It also supports these kinds of efforts. We have this risk scale that I alluded to earlier. We can now, through statistics, score people based on their characteristics and be about 70% accurate in terms of whether or not they'll commit a new crime. Ten years ago, we didn't have the capabilities to do that. That allows us to place people on this continuum, low risk, moderate risk, high risk. Once you're able to do that, then why not spend the dollars that reflect that risk? Why, in fact, would you place a low risk on a costly program? Um, so as these programs develop, what I see is also the technology is developing that allows us to place people in the program differentially, and then we will start allocating the dollars more effectively. Um, and I think that that's where all of this eventually leads to a good sentencing system. Um, it makes a whole lot more sense than what you know we're now doing, which is this. Um, now, I just have one more slide, and then I'll stop talking. Um, because I think when people say, well, you know, why do some states get into this and other states don't? People say, well, we can't develop these kinds of programs because our offenders are too serious or not serious enough or whatever. In fact, whether or not a state chooses to do, do any of these programs, it's been studied that it's mainly a policy issue. It did not relate to crime. Um, how many people you choose to incarcerate in Texas often does not relate to how much crime is out there. It's how tough, and that's a, a simple word for a lot of emotions, how tough your citizenry is and how much it wants to pay for protection. Here is the states aligned on the number of people they incarcerate per 100,000 of their population. And you can see that Texas is about right here. This, this line right here. Um, you're about, I think if I, I think when I did this, you were about 13 from the top. That means the proportion of your citizenry that you put in prison. Now, if it wasn't simply a policy issue about how, uh, that, your array on this, if it was just how much crime, people say, well, of course we put more people in prison, we have more crime. Well, in fact, that is not the case. Because what you see, this is that chart overlaid with a chart which shows your crime rate. Now, if, if the incarceration rate was simply a function of the crime rate, you would see a, a line that went basically like this. These two things would track. You see there's almost no relationship between a state's incarceration rate and its crime rate, and that it is basically this, it, there's no relationship. If you did this statistically, you'd find no relationship. What that means is that it is not a function of crime rate, and states can choose to do whatever they feel like doing, and in fact have chosen to do very different things with their population. You see very high rates, for instance, um, way down here, Colorado. Very high crime rate, very low percent of their population incarcerated. Um, you see a lot of a lot of northeastern states, Massachusetts, um, you know, down in here, Vermont, Maine, uh, Rhode Island. A lot of these states down here have some have um, you know, lower crime rates, high incarceration rates. Most treat a very large percent of their people in the, in the community. Um, so the point I'm trying to make is that these things are not dictated. They're manipulatable, um, and states can, in fact, change their position on this chart. Like the state of Georgia, two years ago, was up here, moved to, now Georgia, is 10. In a matter of three years, can simply make a policy that certain kinds of offenders will not be sent to prison, and could dramatically affect their position on this chart. You see Nevada, who has high crime rate, very high incarceration rate. California, you know, we, it's important to understand that it's not a given. And I guess that's the point that I'm trying to make. Okay, that is all I have to say formally. I'd be happy to answer any questions about any of this. <laughs>
question I have is about the uh, boot camp program. We should be evaluating those as well. No, we don't have uh, any plans to evaluate those. And when I did this seminar this morning, I had a chart which uh, showed where we're conducting randomized experiments at RAN. Um, we're actually doing about 10 states in the adult area and another 10 states in the juvenile area. So we're doing a lot of um, field experimentation. And um, I made this pitch in the morning session. I mean, there's a lot of jobs out there. There's a lot of work in this area. Um, if, if people are interested, I, mean, I think there's a need for good researchers and quantitative people who are interested in uh, all facets. I, mean, I used to work in police chain that was my thing for a while. Yes, uh, I, I have a uh, because uh, you know, the rejected introduces some alternative that's like can see the deleted formula, how the risk and the electronic monitoring. I think that we probably are probably be just disappointed with in the present treatment based on the high recidivism rate and overcrowd. But I think that you know the probably the, from the negative point of view is that you know, Present isolated or some the, the image. But there is a one point we cannot deny the prison spend a lot of time to hire this uh, psychologist, sociologist, or you know, the, even the religion, you know, the chambers in prison. But you just uh, you just mentioned lots of alternative form of point seems a little you know, negative. You just you know the and that's not how to call the supervision, how to the work, even the you know, listen with the uh, lecture monitor. Are there any the, the positive programs that say like how to you know, we educate or we have a the program to combine or compare this kind of a program? I think probably right? I, I agree with you. I I think we need to, to make the distinction between how we sell these programs to the public and get them funded what we really do when we've got the money. Um, and in my experience, they're two different things. You've got to remember 10 years ago, probation and parole, and there still is a big movement in the United States, to abolish them altogether. They have never been able to show that anything that they do necessarily makes anybody better. I'm not saying that what they that, that can't be shown. They just have never developed the evidence to do so. So probation and parole saw in this prison crowding crisis a way to get back as a player in the game. And they have done that very effectively. So if you talk to a chief probation officer or parole officer, they know exactly what they're doing and they will tell you that they need to do this to get back as part of the player. But once they get back, once they get the money, once they get the position, they are still trying very hard to do what you would say rehabilitation kinds of activity. And I, I have kind of a problem. I think it's really a semantic difference. These programs require people to be employed, require you to be drug free and you're tested, require you to go to AA. I mean, when I was at Ohio State 15 years ago, I, I worked in a halfway house that was supposedly doing rehabilitation. Those were the exact same things we did. And that was in the name of rehabilitation. Now they are being done in the name of intensive supervision and getting tough. I'm not so sure that the only thing that probably has gone by the way board, if you talk to a probation and parole officer, is maybe the personal one-to-one -one counseling. But I think a lot of what these programs do is very much designed to rehabilitate. It's just they don't use that word. They use control and they use monitoring. Um, but the people doing it, I think share your frustration. We all know the best way is not to just get tough, but you've got to provide some alternatives for these people. I think these programs try to do that. But you've got to face reality. The public does not care about doing that. They don't believe that probation and parole officers really know how to do it. Because there's so much publicity around it, surrounding nothing works mentality, and the public believes that. And so they are fed up, and they basically just want control. Um, two points. Um, 
it's ultimately up to the judges to decide whether they're incarcerated or whether they're put on probation. Um, what are the judges feelings toward these kinds of programs? And is it not maybe known that, that um, these programs need to be presented to and sold to? And second, you mentioned that the probation officers are becoming uh, more like policemen. Wouldn't it be better to make split the probation office up into two sections, one section that actually police and watch the probationer, and then another section that did the counseling? Um, the first point, the judges really make or break these programs, is absolutely correct. Um, and judges are really very thirsty for these kinds of alternatives in their jurisdiction. Um, they are the people that are most frustrated by having very few options. Um, I've participated in a number of seminars for judges, and there's overwhelming support for putting something between probation, which they don't feel works, and more often, they also don't feel politically they can put somebody on probation anymore because it's seen as a slap on the wrist. Yet they don't want to send them to prison. So I think in every jurisdiction I've worked in, the judges can become the most vocal supporters of these programs. Your second question about shouldn't we split probation and parole officers, the Georgia program does in essence some of that. If the team of 25 probationers are assigned to what's called a surveillance officer, the probation aid. That team, one of which does rehabilitation, that is his primary goal, servicing and, and that type of thing, and the other does surveillance. As a team, they supervise this caseload of 25 to 40. And that's how they've gotten out of this uh, kind of the role conflict um, that happens when somebody's trying to do both things. And a lot of jurisdictions have modeled themselves after Georgia. Um, and if they can afford it, more expensive than doing it again. But I think that you're right that they, the actual personnel get very frustrated because they don't know exactly what they're supposed to be doing out there. One way to do it is you specify the roles very particularly and let each one of them take one. And um, it's worked well in those jurisdictions that have that. So the policy implications impact is what you do. Have you looked at and considered what kind of impact these kind of things are going to have on the states that have developed sentencing guidelines over the past three or four years and the ones that are trying to get that started? Because that's that kind of plays in there. I just wondered if y'all considered that. We have, and um, I've worked actually with a couple of states who are trying to build in, if you're familiar with sentencing guidelines, they frequently have an in outline. You know, if you score a certain amount, you go to prison. If you score less than that amount, you're out. So it's in out kind of thing. We are trying to work with a number of states, and there's um, three or four that actually have developed grids that instead of this two way line are beginning to place a band in the middle. So if you score very high, you go to prison. If you score very low, you go to probation. But in the middle, there is now starting to be a grid, and I'm sure that we will see it, um, that allows for these options and places people in them, just like we've done the past with probation and uh, prison. I think that's some positive effect that we've been able to have. Anything else? Well, I appreciate your attention for listening, and uh, I'll be around for a while.